Well, welcome to everybody. Um, my name is John Del Briscoli. I'm the Director of Player Development and Community Outreach, um, as I'm, I'm sure many of you all know. Um, we're, uh, we're kicking off kind of our community event uh, theme, uh, part of our online program uh, for this season. And uh, we're really excited to, to kind of kick it off um, with something really special. Um, and it is a presentation from our own director of soccer, Peter Kim, um, who is also the head coach of the Middlebury College women's soccer team and, and has been for, for quite a long time now, coach. Um, and, uh, you know, Pete will get into this a little bit, but this is really kind of the kickoff uh, for this season of um, a really kind of all-encompassing approach to helping our players with college soccer um, and just the college process in general a little bit as well. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to Pete um, and I'll let him run with things. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end um, and the way that the Q&A will work is uh, you can message me directly um, if you have a question and I can put you in the queue to ask a question at the end. Um, if you don't feel comfortable asking the question yourself, you can just type the question to me as well. Um, and I can ask Pete uh, at the end um, too. So either way works. Um, and yeah, okay. Now, without further ado, here's Coach Peter Kim. Thanks a lot, John. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many of you out here tonight. And um, Looking forward to uh, helping out as much as I possibly can, uh, regardless of where you are in your college search process or whether you are a player or a parent. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, let's see if that works. John, can you give me a thumbs up if you see that? Yeah, I can see your screen. Got it. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Um, so um, my hope is that we're going to make this uh, whatever you need it to be. I'm not going to make any assumptions about uh, where you are in your process or what you know. So I'm going to try to share as, um, some of the things that I think you should know and then try to as quickly as possible get to um, the, the Q&A session. So uh, just a little bit of background uh, so you understand where I'm coming from. So George and I uh, started Capital Soccer in 1998 um, and incorporated in the January 1999. And we had a few years of of um, getting the club up and running with all of our programs. And then he and I both um, dived into the college world. Uh, I, I headed down to Middlebury and George um, went to UVM where he was uh, assistant coach for the women's program there. And, um, you know, we had a ton of learning to do about the recruiting process. It was like drinking from a fire hose. I mean, it, there, there are so many rules, there's so many timelines. And um, the, more that, uh, the more that we learned, the more we realized how challenging it must be for, for, um, for players out there to navigate this whole college search process and uh, the recruiting world. So we've been uh, putting on uh, these types of events uh, intermittently throughout our time. And, um, you know, I've now just completed my 17th season at Middlebury and I'm still learning. And while I'm still learning, the landscape keeps changing. The NCAA keeps adjusting its rules. And then on top of that, you throw in uh, the pandemic and uh, a lot of rules go out the window. So uh, I would not be surprised if it left some of you scratching your head. And I'm hoping that this will answer uh, some of your questions. So here we go. Um, I think. All right, I'm going to start um, with a little bit of a spoiler alert here. Um, there is um, something that I want to end with and something that's going to permeate the entire uh, um, 
conversation tonight. And that is uh, my, my um, firm opinion, unwavering opinion, that the goal of this entire process from start to finish is for you, the soccer player, student athlete, to be happy. And that's, uh, I, I need to be very, very clear about that. I am hoping that you all have a really happy and fulfilling uh, four years of college, if that's what you uh, go for. And, uh, you know, college is supposed to be some of the best years of your life and you should make the right choice. And there are a lot of factors out there that can sway you away from making your, the decision based on, on that um, criterion alone. So uh, I, as we go along, you'll hear me say it time and time again. So I figured I'd put it out right there from the beginning. Um, you may want to get recruited. You may want to, um, you know, apply a whole lot of filters um, that have have to do with what other people think about you. And um, please let me give you some sort of license to um, to make your search about your happiness and your fulfillment and uh, and nothing else. So moving on, um, this is my agenda for the evening. Uh, we're going to get, um, we're going to help you get started in your search process. And I apologize if this is review for some of you, um, but uh, we'll go through it quickly. And then of course, I'll answer uh, any questions at the tail end. Uh, we'll talk about um, the NCAA divisions and what, uh, what conferences mean. Uh, and then we'll get into that um, nasty business that is recruiting. We'll get a little bit into the um, the financial piece, and then uh, I've left the 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 tail end of the presentation for little words of wisdom that I've accumulated over the years of of um, working with with people of uh, of your age uh, as you go through your college search process. So. To get started, um, there's a strapping looking lad who's playing his college soccer just a couple of years ago. I don't know if any of you recognize him. Um, he was a, a, at least a little bit um, cleaner cut back then, but um, uh, that is of course your director of uh, coaching and community outreach himself, the man, the myth, the legend. So to start your college search process, uh, I want you to, to literally, quite literally, whether you're a computer person or a pen and paper person, start a list that you can make a running list of your uh, search criteria. And I, and I insist on it being running because your priorities are gonna change as you learn more about the colleges that are out there. Um, and you know, there's a there's a, just a handful in front of you of some basic ones. How how big of a school you're looking at, the location of the school, not just in what part of the country, but uh, the setting or urban or rural uh, or somewhere in between. Um, warm climate, cold climate, um, proximity to mountains, you name it. Uh, the the majors that the school offers. Um, you know, what's the campus like? Do you do you want a school that has a, you know, a, a sprawling campus or one that's part of the city that's in, um, it's just part of downtown? Um, job placement rates, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I want you to keep that list, cross ones out that don't, uh, that start to lose their meaning to you or their importance to you. And keep adding things as you learn about um, the schools that are out there and probably most importantly about yourself and what you want. Uh, please understand that there are just about 4,000 colleges and universities in this country, which means that there is a place or um, several places for everybody out there. Um, and now would be the time for you to start making those initial lists. Um, if you need a place to start from from scratch, I would suggest a couple of places. Um, the College Board website uh, has a ton of resources 
uh, and guidance on how to go about your college search process. And then while it's not everything, and um, I think it gets uh, uh, maybe a little bit more hype than, than maybe it deserves, all in all, the U.S. News and World Report, um, their rankings um, remain sort of the gold standard for college rankings out there and a good place for you to start if you're looking for um, for a specific type of college, for example, because they will break it down, not just by universities, but by um, liberal arts schools, technical schools, et cetera, et cetera. Go to the college website, but uh, you have to dig, you have to do your research. Um, the admissions um, tab on every college website would be a great place to start because they will essentially guide you through um, how, how to look at their college and what they want to highlight. But, uh, you know, check out the, um, the academic pages, uh, the athletic pages, of course, um, the campus tours, most colleges at this point with, uh, with the pandemic, just about all of us have virtual tours of campus. Um, so uh, dig around, surf around, and use that piece of paper or that spreadsheet that I um, talked about earlier to record things that you like. And the next best thing to knowing what you like is knowing what you don't like. High schools all have college counselors. They're called different things depending on what school you go to, but nonetheless, these people really know what they're doing. Um, I have have the benefit of of uh, interacting with a lot of these people, and these are, um, you know, pretty regularly some of the smartest people in the building. They're just they're on it, and they are there for you. They're trying to help you find the right school for you. So if you have not reached out to your counselor, or worse yet, if you don't know who your counselor is yet, now would be the time to um, uh, to to source that person out and um, and connect with them and let them know that you're just starting out or or fill them in on where uh, where you are in your process. Friends and family is an amazing place to start. Um, players who are on this call, um, you will have the added benefit of learning a little bit uh, of uh, information about your parents that you didn't know if you ask them about their college experience. There are some things that I'm sure will remain top secret, but um, other than that, they'll be able to share what they liked and didn't like about their college experience, uh, why they chose the school that they did. And, um, you know, especially if they are active in the alumni world, then they might be able to help you, um, you know, learn a little bit more about their alma mater. Uh, at the same time, friends, and I, I would highlight any of you who, um, who are in high school right now, you have a batch of friends, I'm certain, um, you know, if nowhere else than your, your high school soccer team who just went off to college. And this doesn't have to be um, college soccer players. It can be anybody who just went off to college, send them a text, give them a call, set up a Zoom call, and just talk to them about their search process and how they landed uh, on the school that they they found and and you know why they picked it. So you have resources right there at your disposal already. Club coaches, uh, I've I've already mentioned to you that you know between myself as a college coach, um, John as a a former. Um, top level college player. Um, George, uh, who uh, coached at the division one level as well, you have a, a great resource in addition to a number of our other staff members who played college soccer, either at the division one or division three level. Um, so start by asking your coach at training or shooting him or her a, um, a message and, and let them know that you're thinking about uh, playing in college. This is not a commitment, so you don't have to play college soccer if you're not sure, but err on the side of, of starting that conversation now, um, and you can decide as you go along um, 
which direction you want to go from there. So please reach out to them. I will also say, uh, I'm imagining several of you who um, are, uh, are younger and newer to the process uh, won't know that uh, since the club began, I have been working with players directly, individually. Um, I have I have uh, invited students to to my campus to do mock interviews. We have done mock interviews over Zoom. I have uh, critiqued uh, resumes and uh, sent them back for uh, for adjustments. Uh, I have proofread uh, emails to coaches. I have uh, critiqued player videos. Um, because this is what I'm doing all the time. So I have a good sense of uh, what, what to put in there and what not to. So please uh, use all of us as a resource um, because that's what we're here for. Okay, now um, that was our quick and dirty version of uh, starting with your search process. And now let's talk a little bit more about the um, the divisions and conferences. And uh, just as a reminder for the, any of you who joined after John's introduction, that John is collecting um, collecting um, questions in the in the chat, and we'll call upon you at the end to uh, uh, to ask your question. So uh, this is why I'm continuing through the the presentation without stopping. So. Um, most of you, and I, this is really important for you to note, most of you uh, think about college soccer and, and the NCAA as being synonymous. Um, and by and large, uh, the colleges and universities that we're looking at will be uh, affiliated with the NCAA. Um, but there are others. There are other conferences. There are other, uh, sorry, there are other um, institutions that govern some uh, some sports, and uh, you know it's it's worth checking out to make sure that they are NCAA affiliated if that's what you're looking for. Um, and if you have questions about non NCAA affiliated uh, schools, then I'm happy to connect with you individually about those. So. Um, there are three divisions in uh, in the NCAA, and I lay them out very specifically in this way in, in front of you. Um, many of you out there watch uh, professional soccer, and you um, you think about the English Premier League and the Championship, et cetera, et cetera, as Division One, Division Two, and Division Three, and it's very much a vertical structure where. The top teams from Division Two move up uh, to Division One, um, and that is the the highest realm of of soccer in that country. Here, our college system isn't quite like that. We have a, more of a horizontal system, where the uh, the divisions don't depend necessarily on the quality of the uh, of the athletics, but more on the size of the school. The, the budget that is put into the um, the um, uh, athletics and um, the priority that they put um, on the sports. So, um, you know, Division One tends to be the biggest schools and the schools with um, very big budgets. Oftentimes, these are schools with huge um, football and men's basketball programs. Um, that are, are big money generators and um you know that uh, that certainly will change the dynamic on campus a little bit um these are also schools that offer um, scholarships um, at some level or another not all the same um, division three um, t oftentimes tends to be smaller schools and um and geared a little bit more towards a balanced approach to your your college experience with um, uh, you know balancing academics and athletics and perhaps other um, extracurriculars as well. And um, you know just um, because it seems a little bit peculiar, I want you to to note that I'm not the only one who will tend to talk about Division one and then jump to Division three because they're, um, they're the most common um, divisions for colleges. There's not as many Division II schools. Um, and Division II is, um, 
kind of a strange mix of division one and division three. Um, they can be small schools or big schools. They can have scholarships or no scholarships. Um, they have their own set of rules. And so they're, they're different than division one or division three. And it's worthwhile, depending on what type of school you're looking at to delve into what the rules are about those schools. But um, you, do, you should understand that that division one doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, my freshman year of college, um, uh, Soccer America ranked the top schools, uh, top soccer programs in the country. And um, the number one team on their list was uh, University of Southern Connecticut, which was a division two program and UCLA, which ultimately won the national championship, I believe, um, or was number one for the entire year. They, um, they were number two on the Soccer America list. Um, and, you know, even, I know uh, this might surprise you, but um, there's also a, 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 um, a association called the NAIA um, and Little Green Mountain College down in Pulteney, Vermont, used to be an NAIA school. And they were a scholarship program that had, you know, th their team was largely made up of, you know, 20 to 26 year old, uh, you know, European players um, who, who, and they were one of the best teams in the country uh, for quite a long time. So uh, I tell you all this to let you know that, that you shouldn't, uh, um, overgeneralize what each of these things mean because there are division three teams that um, that are far superior to some division one teams. There are division two teams that might be the best uh, in the country. And there are division one teams that, of course, we all know the, the top schools um, that are oftentimes on ESPN, but there's also schools that, you know, really, really struggle and, will, and, and never see the postseason. Um, Divi uh, regardless of the division, if you are part of the NCAA, there will be a postseason tournament to determine the national champion uh, uh, of the uh, NCAA for your division. And it's a worthwhile thing for you to note if you are interested in potentially playing for a national championship uh, to, to find out whether uh, the school you're looking at is, uh, is a contender in that regard. Um, so we mentioned size and budget as being the, the main um, differentiator between these uh, three divisions. Um, scholarships. This is a, uh, a very interesting um, topic because uh, everybody wants a college scholarship. Everyone wants to be paid to go to school. Um, division one uh, schools and some division two schools will have scholarships. Um, there is a maximum number of scholarships per uh, per team and per sport. So for soccer, I believe the the um, the national maximum for for a fully funded Division One school is um, a soccer program is fourteen scholarships um, for a Division One uh, team. And I believe for men, I haven't checked it lately, but I believe it's a little bit over nine or a little bit under 10 full scholarships um, per team. Conferences. Um, the, the teams within the country have, um, have organized themselves together, uh, oftentimes based on geographical regions, um, but not only. Um, you know, my conference, for example, we we are a collection of schools that are very similar in our in our academic rigor, our our, um, our admissions standards, but also we are all close by, so we're all a drive away. But our our leading competitor uh, in uh, in the national rankings uh, tends to be the UAA, and um, those schools include Brandeis in Boston. Uh, um, Emory in Georgia, University of Chicago, um, so they, uh, Rochester, they, these teams fly to their games uh, every weekend. So it's not always a geographical arrangement, but oftentimes it is a competitive arrangement. And, um, you know, the top conferences in each division will tend to send 
uh, certainly their winner, uh, the conference winner to the NCAA championships via the automatic qualification for the champion, but also um, will tend to get at-large bids to the NCAA tournament as well. Um, okay, so again, sorry to whiz through everything, but I do want to get to your questions, so I'm going to keep on going. So um, a, little, uh, a little section about the finances for college. Oops. Sorry, I skipped over a section, my fault. Um, uh, let's get to the recruiting process, um, which is the, probably the biggest mystery of all these things to all of you. Um, so how do I get noticed? Uh, the picture uh, on the side of the screen here is one, this is what it looks like when uh, when I go uh, get on an airplane and fly off to various places around the country, this is what it looks like, is a bunch of us hanging out at these tournaments, taking notes on players. Um, and then it, um, most often before uh, and definitely after, we will receive letters from players expressing their interest in our school. So for starters, uh, every just about every uh, college soccer program will have a recruiting form on their website. And these are very often overlooked. And I'm, I'm telling you this right now because I encourage you to fill out as many of these things as you can. Um, so if you have uh, the slightest bit of interest in a school, go to the website and get yourself um, uh, uh, signed up on their recruiting form. It will ask you for academic information, um, of course, your graduation year, uh, and uh, potentially uh, a place to upload video links, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, importantly, it will also put you into the coach's database, which means that any time the coach wants to communicate out to the wider, wider audience about upcoming camps, um, happenings on campus, things like that, you will, you will be on that list and receive that information from, from him or her. So um, anytime you're looking at a school, take the time to fill out these recruiting forms. They're not just there for fluff. Um, and I, I know this um, from experience that at the end of the process, when I'm finishing my recruiting uh, and I'm, I'm now starting to liaise with my, uh, my admissions office about the players that I want, they're going to come back to me and say, hey, um, we don't have any information in the database for this player because most often uh, us coaches share our uh, database with our uh, admissions office. So um, there's a, a double bonus uh, for you guys to fill that out. Your resume, um, if you don't have one, you should make one. And uh, John and I have, have uh, teamed up to create a Capital so Soccer Club template, a fillable resume that, um, that you can have. Uh, we'll email it out to you and you can uh, just download it and then fill in your information so that you have a little bit of guidance on what information is uh, valuable for coaches. Um, but you can also use us to, um, to look it over once, um, uh, you, once you've completed it. So I, I can't emphasize this enough. Please use it. Uh, please create uh, create uh, your resume sooner rather than later. Um, just to answer the question, probably before it's asked, um, many of you may have received solicitation from various uh, third parties, um, the National Collegiate Scouting Association is the one that pops to mind, but there are there are dozens of them out there that are looking for you to sign up for the uh, with them, pay a little bit of a fee, and then they're going to broadcast you to a lot of coaches. I will tell you from my um, my vantage point, and also from uh, uh, all the coaches that I know that I've spoken to, um, if any of those emails come in from third parties, we tend to delete them. Um, so. Uh, 
I prefer to hear directly from the players themselves as opposed to having uh, a middleman, a almost an agency um, reaching out to me. So uh, I encourage you to do the work yourself. Um, the only value I do see in them is that um, sometimes they provide a great um, sort of personal website for you to um, to send a link to the coaches uh, that you know that contains everything your resume your uh, your videos uh, your references and all that but nothing that you can't do just by sending off uh, a resume send an email to the coach um, whenever you're interested in the school make it personalized um, the coach does not want to receive a an email that is um, that is to a hundred coaches uh, cater it to his or her program it uh, you know bonus points if you know something about the school or about the program already um, we all know that you are emailing a lot of a lot of different coaches but do yourself a favor and proofread your emails um, I have uh, you know I, I I'd have a, a good chunk of change if I had a nickel for every time someone wrote me an email that said, dear coach Kim, it's been my lifelong dream to play at Amherst college. Um, and oops, you know, they, they changed the coach's name, but they didn't change the, uh, the school name. And, um, you know, they, those players, I think were, we're lucky if their email got deleted. More often, I tend to email them back and say, hey, just wanted to know if you meant to send this to Amherst College because um, uh, they didn't receive it if you did. So um, look it over and make sure that you have put your information in there. This is another thing that we are happy to uh, take a look at if you, if you want. Um, if you want some feedback or some suggestions on types of things that you can put in there. But in the, in the end, this is, um, this is also great practice for you because this is a cover letter. It's a cover letter that you might write for, um, for a job opportunity as well. So you're gonna be writing these things for uh, many, many years to come. Um, and this is a great place to start. Highlight videos. Um, this is another one where there are a million companies out there that are charging an arm and a leg and they'll do all sorts of cool things like, you know, you know, put the music in and slow mo and fast mo and, and, and all that stuff in between special effects. Um, I don't buy into it and most coaches don't either. Um, some of the best videos that I've ever received have been done by mom and dad um who have who filmed and yep i hear way to go johnny in the background um you know but the one thing i know um, and that i can trust with those videos is that the the camera was always trained on you um and so i got some some authentic clips of you and in terms of breaking it down all of you are able to do that on your phone now way better than i i am and if you're for some reason you don't know how to do that um i'm sure you know by now that that john della briscoli is an absolute wizard with video and um can can probably give you a two minute to tutorial and make you an expert so um so highlight videos if you need help in figuring out what to put in there then uh, by all means do that I, um i will tell you that um just a little um something that's interesting to me I like basic re resume information to come up as the first and last screens. So when I click a video on YouTube, the first thing that will come up will be text of your name, your class um, position, if you have one, um, and then um, and maybe GPA and any pertinent academic information. And then when the video begins, you have to make sure that you are highlighted. So um, there are all sorts of tools to circle you or point an arrow at you or um, turn everybody to black and white except for you uh, staying in color. One way or another, the coach uh, needs to know which player you are in those videos. And then at the end, um, you know, circle back to your personal information 
um, so that uh, that it's readily available for the coach. Uh, put your contact information there too, in case the coach is so excited about the video that he just watched that uh, he wants to call you or email you straight off the bat. Uh, unofficial visits. Uh, there, are, this is um, getting into the sort of NCAA ease, um, the the language of recruiting. Uh, an unofficial visit is any visit that you take to a college where you weren't invited um, and nothing was paid for by the the program. And you can do these anytime you want. Uh, you can do as many of them as you want. Um, but while you're on campus. Um, Please uh, make sure that you, of course, visit, uh, visit the admissions office and take the tour and sit in on the, um, the college information session that every admissions office runs. A little um, backdoor hint uh, or, or a word to the wise, when you apply to a school, uh, there, there is an, uh, a couple of check boxes on your actual form that gets passed around to the admissions officers in committee that uh, indicates whether you've been on campus and whether you've attended the uh, admission sessions or not um, because they want people who have expressed so much interest in the school that they've actually come to visit so um, so i encourage you to to make sure that you do both of those things at uh, at the admissions office and then make sure that you um, reach out to the coach in advance and try to meet him or her and sit down for uh, an informal meeting. And this is where uh, our, our um, mock interviews have come in handy for a lot of students. Happy to do these over Zoom now that we have that these days, um, but definitely don't miss the opportunity to make a, a good first impression by sitting in a coach's office. Some of them will give you um, five, 10 minutes of their time. And some of them will give you an hour and a tour of the of the athletic facilities. And you have to be prepared for both. And you have to be able to uh, speak about yourself while maintaining eye contact um, with, uh, with the coach. Clinics and camps. Um, mo most schools will conduct some sort of camp um, on the on the campus. Um, or the coaches will visit other teams or other schools, uh, clinics or camps throughout the year. Um, in addition, there are a number of private organizations that run clinics and camps that will advertise which, um, which coaches will be there. However, there's, there's a very big asterisk to that. Um, and I've learned this from experience is that, um, I remain on every website of every clinic and camp I've ever worked. And I only work one, um, one camp that is not affiliated with, um, with a school. Um, and yet there are a number of businesses that have either my image or my name or my college's name on the website. So um, what that list is, oftentimes is who's worked here in the past, not who's going to be there this time. And it would be very disappointing for you if you showed up to a clinic and paid a ton of money only to find out that the school whose coach you wanted to see you wasn't even there. So um, if, you're, if you're not sure what that list is, then email the, um, the camp director and ask. Um, and I also tend to work at uh, a handful of other schools. Um, so uh, in addition to my own camps, I will work at the Princeton camp and the Harvard camp, for example, um, and the Columbia camp, um, because we cross over so much in our, um, in our applicant pool. You will notice um, something that's been conspicuously absent from this list, um, which I would imagine many of you would have thought would have been um, front and center on that list, and that is tournaments and showcases. And this gets to the heart of sort of the mythology of, of the recruiting process, because I think that, that a lot of people think that you, you uh, sign up for a club, you, um, you 
your club team goes to these tournaments and there's these coaches who show up with blank notebooks and look out over the field and say, oh, there's one that I like. I'm going to invite him or her to my school. And it's just not how it works. And unfortunately, the, uh, the club world is guilty of perpetuating this myth um, because that's how um, so many clubs will get players to cross over to their club is by saying these are the tournaments that we go to. Um, when in reality, um, when I go to a tournament, um, somewhere between 90 and 100% of the players that I watch are players that wrote to me and invited me to come watch them play with with um, detailed scheduling information about where I could find them on what field, at what time, in what color, wearing what jersey number, playing what position, um, playing which half if you're a goalkeeper with two goalkeepers. Um, so I will find players by those who write to me and then by extension, players who are on those fields um, who might jump out at me, um, um, wh who's whose uh, GPA tends to fit in with um, what I'm looking for as well. So those tournaments and showcases, sure, we do rec recruit there, but you are in Vermont. There are, um, there are no teams here in Vermont that are going to the top tournaments. Um, there's not a single, there's not a single club that is going to the top tournaments. There are a couple of clubs that are going to a couple of, um, one decent tournament here or there. Um, but generally speaking, the, the Vermont players that have moved on uh, to, um, to succeed at the college that they were really interested in, again, going back to what they wanted out of their college experience, um, they tended to find that success by going to a camper clinic um, and being picked out there. So, uh, sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit earlier, but now uh, we have reached that point about um, the finances. So, um, athletic scholarships do exist. Um, I think it's just hard to wrap your mind around how few of them there are. Um, the, the pretty consistent stat is that 2% of high school athletes end up getting a scholarship of some sort. Um, and that leaves an awful lot of players who are playing on their own dime or um, on somebody else's dime besides their own or, or, the, um, or the soccer teams. So um, a few things to note about athletic scholarships. Number one, the, um, the four year scholarship is just shy of a myth. Um, so even though you might end up earning a, um, a scholarship to a college and it might go for four years, uh, it, except for in the most um, uncommon and extreme circumstances, those four years are, are not guaranteed. So they're, they're renewed each year. And these scholarships, um, uh, you know, can be taken away, they can uh, be reduced, or on the flip side, they can be increased. Um, and some, and oftentimes they can even be negotiated. So um, I, I think a lot of people didn't know that that was the nature of the, um, the scholarship world. Um, scholarships can be full or partial. Um, and nowhere is this more evident than uh, here at UVM where um, where in-state tuition is so different from out-of-state tuition and that changes the number of scholarships um, that the, uh, the amount of scholarship money that they have left and it, um, oftentimes schools will have uh, um, a little bit of money and they'll say well we could pay for your books or we could pay for your room and board um, or we can cover your tuition, but not your room and board. And um, I think it's it's worthwhile for you to know that it's a little bit more nuanced than just uh, uh, an athletic scholarship. Um, 
it's completely dependent on the school how many uh, scholarships, if any, are offered. Um, just as a reminder, Division Three does not offer athletic scholarships uh, uh, at all. So uh, it's only Division One schools and some Division Two schools um, that do so. And the um, the school can choose to uh, to support a particular sport any way that they want. So the uh, I mentioned, for example, that uh, Division One uh, programs like Stanford, for example, which oftentimes is the number one team on the women's side, um, will have 14 scholarships uh, available per year. And um, uh, th those scholarships, um, you know, at Stanford, that might not translate to a school that you're looking at. Um, they, might, they might be a Division I school, but only have five scholarships available. Um, so you have to ask and, and find out um, what that is all about. So um, um, athletic scholarships don't count on one. Um, I hope you've done your planning um, besides that. So just in case you're not one of the 2% that gets one, you still, uh, you still can go to school. Um, financial aid. Uh, Financial aid has, is a huge part of um, schools' budgets and um, and or endowments, and um, there are a bunch of different kinds of financial aid. Um, the one that you're most interested in are the grants because they do not have to be paid back. Um, loans, um, which do have to be paid back, um, and then work study opportunities where. Um, you have the opportunity to have a job on campus and um, that will make you money towards um, towards your college expenses. Um, you know, and it's worthwhile to really dive into um, what financial aid looks like at your school um, to figure out how, how you're gonna pay for it and how much you're going to owe, if anything, when you finish. Um, there are, um, there is a consortium of, of schools. I believe there's 50 of us uh, in the country who guarantee that they will meet 100% of assessed need um, through financial aid. Um, and you can find that list on the College Board website or just by Googling it. Um, there are some schools um, that are 100% grant in financial aid and no loans. Um, so Harvard, which I think has a, somewhere around a $63 billion endowment, um, they they went several years ago to, to no loans whatsoever. So students who go there um, uh, under financial aid will not, uh, will not owe anything when they graduate. Um, if you are unsure, then most schools will have a financial aid calculator on their admissions uh, website or linked um, from their admissions website to the student financial services website. So uh, I want you to um, take a moment to find that whenever you go to a, a school website um, and, and you'll be able to input your various financial information and that will give you sort of a, a, a general idea of what type of financial aid you might qualify for uh, if you were to be accepted to that school. Um, a, uh, a, an important side note here, um, and I, I think this is really valuable for you to know, is that some schools, um, but not all, are, are need blind. My school, for example, is need blind, which means that your uh, request for financial aid is um, is not uh, known by the admissions office, and the admissions office will not base any decisions on whether uh, an applicant has applied for financial aid or not. Some schools prioritize uh, paying students, and it's worth knowing that um, because it could change your chances of being accepted to that school. Um, also, uh, I, I do want you to know that there are other scholarships out there 
that that are not from the athletic department or the financial aid department. They're private scholarships. They're um, endowed scholarships. Your school um, counselor will uh, have access to uh, you know worlds of of these types of opportunities that you can apply for. And sometimes you even just get them by merits of your academic performance. Uh, I know that Vermont has a great program where the top uh, top level students um, can get. Uh, uh, awards to attend uh, Vermont schools um, because of the caliber of student you are. Um, I will note just before I change the page here that the um, uh, the financial aid department should uh, emphasis on should be very very separate from the athletic department. Um, I don't even know who my uh, financial uh, aid officers are. Um, because you can see quite easily how it could get a little bit muddy um, where schools that don't offer scholarships might be able to, if they have a cozy relationship with their financial aid office, might be able to just find that, that grant that applies to the Vermont senior left wing who, um, you know, it's, you get the picture. Um, so, um, they should keep it uh, very, very separate. And if they don't, then you might want to ask a few more questions about that, um, the way they do business there. Okay, moving right along um, to my list of helpful tips and pitfalls to avoid. If you're not sure who that is, but you think it's familiar, Yes, you have the good fortune of looking at a 19-year-old George Cook. Um, and all I have to do is say, you're welcome. Um, so that is George um, executing one of his textbook full volleys as a member of the uh, Castleton University men's soccer team. Um, helpful tips. Um, the, uh, the, the two best times to start your college search are um, early and right now. So, um, you know, don't freak out if, uh, if you didn't start, if you're a junior or senior and you hadn't started already, um, you know, you're fine. There's many, of, many other people in your shoes as well. You might have to be a little bit more diligent um, in your weekly timeline as opposed to your uh, yearly or monthly timeline. Um, so start as early as you can. Um, the conversations that I have with players and the the, uh, the emails that I get from players most often come from sophomores and juniors in high school. Um, I am getting regular uh, um, communications from seniors and I will tell you that um, my response is, is consistent to them right now and that is um, that you're too late. Um, that you're welcome to pursue the school, but um, my recruiting, my recruiting, which is considered some of the latest recruiting in the country because of our conference rules, um, finishes on on um, July 1st, uh, in between junior and senior year. So um, there are there are many schools that will complete their recruiting um, much much earlier than that. I, I don't uh, I don't suggest that you turn into one of the um, overzealous individuals like the um, the sixth grader um, who occasionally emails me and says, "Dear coach, um, it's my dream to play it at your school, and I've been playing soccer my entire life, um, which I think is somewhere around twelve if I'm uh, twelve years if I'm doing my math right. So. Um, you know, just get going and ask for the help um, so that you can stay consistent. Um, understand your timeline. I, I ask you to start early, but this is not asking you to decide early. Uh, you decide on your timeline based on when you want to know uh, where you're going to school. Uh, some people are really anxious to commit. Um, I personally discourage people from 
committing too early to schools, um, but that is your personal preference. But um, if you don't want to decide, if you're not sure, it's too big of a decision to make just based on uh, soccer, for example. Um, so I, I really encourage you to, um, to talk it over with your parents and figure out what your timeline is and then adjust it uh, as you go along. Um, do understand your coach's timeline. As I just mentioned to you, there are, um, there are players who um, will miss out on, um, sorry, JD, I just wanna make sure you know there's somebody in the waiting room. Um, the, uh, um, you know, do understand that coaches have their own timelines. So I, uh, I definitely urge you to ask them directly what their timeline is so that you don't miss any uh, important dates, whether it's um, getting your academic information into them, whether it's attending their last camp or clinic before the uh, um, their recruiting window closes for that year, um, things of that nature. Make a plan, sit down with your parents and make a plan for, um, for your steps that you are in charge of as a player and then, of course, all of the steps that involve your parents. That includes, of course, financial decisions about college, um, contacts with coaches. Um, remember also that coaches, um, depending on what division and what conference they are in, will have rules that they have to abide by as to when they can, or they're allowed to speak to you and when they cannot, when they're allowed to um, uh, to come watch you play and when they're not. Uh, I, for example, um, right now I'm in a, a, a re recruiting blackout period. I'm not allowed to set foot off campus and, uh, and do any recruiting at all. Um, so understand um, those rules, but make that plan accordingly um, so that you can visit the schools, you can contact the coaches with all the materials that I've mentioned in the previous uh, sections. Connect with your club coaches. I've said it before, but uh, I just want to remind you that's that's what we're here for. We're we're here to help you. We're here to advance you. We're here to help you um, make soccer be a really fulfilling passion of yours for a long time to come. Um, there are, in addition to NCAA teams, there are also club teams at many many schools that um, that play either regional or national schedules. And um, so your coach might know about schools that have those programs as well, um, but you never know until you're asked. So, uh, um, you know, please uh, send an email or a text to your coach or pull him or her aside at practice and let them know that, um, that you've thrown your hat into this, uh, into this ring. Um, there are rules. If you go to the NCAA website, um, uh, NCAA.org, that is, there are two NCAA websites, NCAA.com and NCAA.org. And NCAA.org will have a, um, uh, a, a host of resources for you, including um, a guide for the prospective student athlete, which will help you navigate the different rules that all of us are, um, are um, governing our, our um, recruiting efforts by. Um, contact timing type of venue. There are some schools, believe it or not, um, who can, uh, coaches can actually do home visits. Um, they can come to your practices at school. Um, they can talk to you after your practice is done or after your game is done. And there are some, some schools that cannot uh, talk to you at all out, off campus. Um, assessments, you know, where do they go? Um, what, how many tournaments are they allowed to go to? Uh, their college might have uh, budgetary restrictions on how many assessments they can do. Um, so these are things that you need to, to learn about. Uh, I'm sure the parents on this call were are hoping that this would pop up, but the, the last thing you want, guys, I know that we're talking about soccer, but but that's just our little slice of the world and your college experience is so much more than that. And, and that's coming from me, who I consider to be one of the biggest soccer heads I know. So um, I want you to keep your grades up so that that is never an obstacle to you um, being accepted into the college you wanna to go to. 
Um, pitfalls to avoid. This is uh, this picture is of Annie Raul, who is um, a capital soccer club player who played for me um, back in the day, and I recruited her to play for me at Middlebury. Um, and you can see her um, as she had uh, suffered an injury in college. Um, so pitfalls to avoid. Number one, I told you I'd come back to it, but losing sight of the number one priority, which is happiness and fulfillment. That is the goal, not to be tapped on the shoulder by a coach and asked to come play at their school. Uh, be careful about committing too early. Commit when you're ready and you're sure that the school is the right choice for you and your family. Um, be careful about any deadlines that the coach or the school might have for uh, information or even applications. Um, that would be a terrible reason to miss out on a great opportunity. Um, Overgeneralizing or grouping, as I mentioned before, every school is different, every coach is different, and it, we as humans tend to try to cluster things in as general a group as possible. So we like to say Division One or Division Two or Division Three, and um, and you know the reality is that it's much more nuanced than that. And just because one coach likes um, a full game video. Um, uh, it doesn't mean another coach wants that at all. They might want a highlight video. Um, some want to uh, meet with you for an hour and some want to meet with you for five minutes. So uh, remember that every school and every coach is different. Um, don't wait to be picked out of a crowd. Uh, do the hard work um, and players uh, do it yourself. Um, get after it on your own. Um, I mentioned these recruiting um, websites that um, try to use a middleman to um, to to get you in front of coaches and how I tend to delete those as do most of my colleagues. Um, another email that will get deleted immediately will be any email from a parent. Um, uh, parents, if it seems like you are leading this charge, um, then uh, that will be an immediate turnoff for uh, most coaches. It's not that um, that we have any sort of animosity. It's that it's difficult enough for us to develop a relationship with a player um, over distance and in a short amount of time. Um, but then if, uh, if we're not even sure if the student's that interested because they haven't done the work, the parents are doing the work, um, that is, um, that's kind of a red flag for us. Same thing when you go visit schools, um, let the let the player do all of the talking, um, you know, and certainly um, weigh in where where your um, information or your opinion is is needed, like uh, affordability and visits and camps and things like that. But when it comes to how good of a player uh, your son or daughter is, uh, leave that up to them. To, uh, to, to tell the coach uh, the, the, the parents should not have any role in, uh, in reaching out to coaches um, for recruiting purposes. Um, in the end, uh, sometimes it's easy to lose your focus and think that it's about um, being spotted. Uh, the goal for you is to be good. Um, so spend your time preparing yourself technically to be good at soccer, to be a contributor on the team. And um, and remember to prepare physically because, um, you know, once you get to college, you know, you're not playing on an age group team anymore. Imagine right now if you are a U14 player in this club, if you were to um, get called up to play for our U18 team, would you step on and start right away? Well, there, for a number of reasons, you probably would not. Um, but when you get to college, you're in U18 player probably playing on a U22 or U23 team. Um, and so physical preparation is crucial, not to mention um, all the stuff that John and Bill do with the club um, helps with injury prevention. One thing I cannot express to you um, more adamantly is how short your college career will be. And poor Annie here missed 25% um, of her college career because of her torn ACL. Um, and I don't want you to be one of those. So def definitely prevent the preventable um, whenever you can. Um, and take care of your body with nutrition and sleep and all that stuff that um, John, John will preach to you. So uh, 
with that, um, here are some of the schools. It's not an exhaustive list, but just a quick look at some of the schools that our uh, Capital Soccer Club alumni have played at. And um, now we've reached that final final part of our presentation, which is our Q and A. Awesome, thanks, Pete. That was great. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat, just uh, some clarification, although I think you might have um, touched base on it a little bit with regards to um, on the timeline when to start. Um, but you were talking about the uh, recruitment forms. How early do you recommend students do that? Uh, I would say anytime that um, you're in high school and you're able to, um, to you know, uh, develop an interest in the school. So um, you can always go back and update your information later. You can, um, you can change all that information. My system, which I know, you know, half the country at least uses, uh, is called Front Rush. And um, it will automatically update profiles that have the same email address or phone number. So um, if you go back to the same form later and enter an SAT score, for example, um, then it'll just update your information in their, in their database. Great. Um, one, th one thing I, I did want to ask a follow-up question, um, and, and somebody actually just sent this question to me as well in the, the chat. Um, you talked about seniors and uh, your, um, your, uh, your response to seniors right now who are getting in touch with you and saying that it's too late. Um, it, do you, do you think that's the case for all of the schools, specifically like D3 schools or? No, and it, it, you know, I think there's, there's a few important um, distinctions to be made in, in, um, in how we each answer that question. Uh, each college coach would answer that question. Um, the reason that I'm doing it right now is because of COVID, uh, because uh, my seniors, uh, all but one of them who, who needed to graduate because she ran out of classes to take at school, all of my seniors decided that they were going to defer a semester and uh, come back to play the season that they missed this year. So, Plus, I did my recruiting on time before uh, those decisions were made. So I'm going to have five classes on campus next year to, to manage. So I just can't take anyone else. Um, and if a school, uh, if a team didn't have that many seniors stick around or had a small class in general or didn't have a big incoming class, then their answer might be different. Likewise, in a normal year, uh, there are some schools that will accept walk-on candidates. Um, so, uh, um, you know, you get into the school and you're offered a, a tryout for the team. Oftentimes you have to prove yourself before that, that you might that you might be a candidate for the team. Um, but um, a, lot, a lot of schools, including my, my own, um, will accept walk-on candidates uh, as well. It's just in terms of academic support for a student, uh, you know, I'm allowed to throw a little bit of weight behind uh, my, my top students, not a lot, but uh, a bit. And, um, you know, I will have run out of that by then. And likewise, if you're looking for a college scholarship um, scholarship dollars will probably have been uh, allocated by that point. And, and um, you know, not so fun fact, um, there are people who, who are, um, who were promised scholarships um, as incoming freshmen, who um, the seniors who have that, uh, have that money and were supposed to have graduated are coming back for another year. And the coach has to decide where that money is going to go, whether it's to the senior or to the incoming freshman. Um, here's another question, um, and I, I think this w will be tricky to, to answer in context of, of COVID, but uh, I think also just generally um, in the, the normal run of things, do colleges look at personal growth years as a plus to help them academically and athletically? 
I, th I think that, um, you know, it comes back to what I said about uh, overgeneralization, that, that every school is different and every sport is different. And, you know, PG years are very common in the hockey world, um, you know, because they're looking for players to, um, to develop physically or maybe reach, um, reach another, uh, another level academically. Um, but uh, some schools want to know um, that you're ready to come to them uh, right away after the school. So it's worth, it's worth asking. And for any of you who are um, considering a PG year, I do want you to know that, um, that I am in contact with an awful lot of, um, of uh, coaches in the, the private schools in the, particularly in the New England and Northeast uh, regions. And um, if you, if you want to be connected with any of those coaches, um, they, they will come to me pretty regularly and say, if you have anyone who's looking to take a PG year, would you mind sending them my way? So I have that relationship with them. So um, COVID, uh, you know, right now I would love kids to take uh, PG years because uh, I'm going to be backed up a little bit uh, at the door this year. Um, so uh, another question here. Um, is the recommendation to pick a few specific day long ID camps and not necessarily the multi day ones with multi multiple college coaches there, especially well, for uh, next summer? Sorry, yeah. The, um, the, the, some of it has to do with the age of the player. You know, there are there are schools that will boast, um, you know, the most college coaches at their events. The, the, the only problem with those, those, um, uh, camps is that they also have the most players at them so you might have 15 or 20 college coaches but you're also going to have 300 players uh, to compete with for their attention and you might not get spotted by the coach that you wanted to watch you so i i find those camps to be better for the younger um players who who have a, a a bigger list or are uncertain about exactly what type of school that they they want but if you have started to narrow down your list then i really encourage you to go directly to that school um, or talk to the coach and say where's the best place for you to see me because i'm really interested in your school and and not those other schools great um that's all the questions I have in the queue. Um, I just, I, I want to revisit the, the senior year thing. And, and I know obviously um, the seniors this year that are graduating in, in 2021 and, and certainly being a high school student in the pandemic currently, right? These are the, the, the only high school students uh, in our time that are going through this. How do you see kind of COVID changing the landscape of recruiting in the future, um, even, when, even when we're past this pandemic? Um, well, I think that, uh, there's a few uh, obvious ones that I see. Um, number one, the, um, the, the emphasis on video has increased. Um, I, never, I never was a, a big fan of video as, as more than sort of a teaser to uh, give me a, 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 bare, a basic sense of who a player was. And now uh, it's the only thing I have. Um, and the other part, and this is really, um, I think a big one for me is that it used to be that you had to go to the school to sit face to face <clears throat> with a coach, ask questions, answer questions about yourself. And with the advent of Zoom, now you can basically sit in a coach's office from your house and have that same conversation. And of course you won't get the tour or the feel of the campus or that feeling of what it's like or, or taste the dining hall food. But um, it, it has miraculously changed the recruiting world. And I've had, so I mean, my entire year has been on Zoom like all of yours, but as a college coach, my Zooms have been with prospective student athletes mostly who, who uh, want to talk about uh, the recruiting process. So you can set up a Zoom call with coaches um, and have a much more in-depth conversation uh, as long as you're prepared to talk about yourself. Awesome. Um, yeah, and 
I, I like that the graphic that you put up of um, some of the schools that our capital alumni have have gone on to and um, over the summer we interviewed my sister Jill who played at UVM and we we um, interviewed Katie Stames who played at St. Lawrence um, and they gave really good context to the happiness bit of of when you are on campus and and what's really important um, you know soccer is, is such a great thing um, but it should be in my opinion and it it was in my experience as a college player uh, a compliment to the college experience um, and and certainly um, you know not not the full main drive um, but yeah um, I actually I, I'm glad you put that that picture of me on the first slide too because I got my Manhattan College men's soccer scarf uh, up behind me. So we just had our 50th anniversary of our program last last season. So uh, yeah, cool. Well, um, I have no more questions uh, in the queue. Um, but like Pete said, um, he is available. I am available. George is available. Eric is available. All of the, the Capital Soccer Club coaches are at your disposal. But also think about the broader Capital Soccer alumni network. Um, we have so many players that have gone on to play college soccer. Um, and, and like Pete said in the very beginning, um, if you know somebody who's gone to that school, um, it can definitely be helpful. Um, if you're not sure if somebody has been there before, you can always reach out to us and say, hey, I'm interested in playing at, you know, the University of, uh, you know, wherever and do you know anybody who, who's played there before um, and maybe we can put you in touch with an alumni uh, from Capital Soccer who, who has come from the, the same exact spot that you've been so um, cool well thank you Pete uh, really appreciate your time thank you to everybody on the call um, Pete any parting words you'd like to offer no just uh, um you know, reminding all of you that the um, that college can be absolutely amazing if you're doing the hard work right now, and I'm hoping that it's the um, the students who are doing that hard work. And um, parents, I know it's hard to watch, um, but ultimately it's going to be the the best decision if the if the student leads the charge and um, and looks for what's going to you know make them happy. And as I always tell my my um, prospective uh, student athletes, the single best thing that you can have to arm yourself for the college uh, search process is self-awareness. You know, what kind of person are you? What kind of people do you want to be around? What kind of environment do you want to find yourself in? Uh, if you know those things um, or have an inkling of those things, it's going to help you um, because there is a school for everybody out there. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Um, everybody have a great night. Um, we'll see you all at some point on the online program and, and see many of you in person at GMCF. Um, and have a great week. <laughs>